Hey guys, welcome back to my YouTube channel. It is Alexis, and today we're going to be doing the 24 books I want to read in 2024. To start off this video, I would first want to say that, like, who knows if this goal would really be completed because for one of my classes, I feel like I always say this, but for one of my classes, I have seven books to read. And that's just one of my English classes that I have to take next semester. So let's just not get into that. And like, let's, let's not be boring here. I have 24 fun books that I want to read on my own time, not related to school whatsoever. But some of them are inspired by school books that I've read in the past. Some of them, I, I'm going to declare if I got it for Christmas or not. So it's kind of like a Christmas book haul and like a, my own books that I've gotten in the past and stuff like that. So I don't know, will I put a Christmas tree at the bottom of the of each book i don't know i have all 24 almost all 24 books here i have like 23 books here ish most of the books i'm just gonna give you the summary that it says on the back first to start off with book lovers by emily henry um i did see this book um when i used to have tiktok i used to see emily henry everywhere and i was like wow people like really love her <laughs> out of all the books she had like something with vacation um beach read something like that i was like okay i might really like book lovers so i picked book lovers as one of the books i wanted to read by her or stevens's life is books she reads them all and she's not just that type of heroine not the plucky one not the laid-back dreamy girl and especially not the sweetheart in fact the only people nora is a heroine for are her clients for whom she lands an enormous deals as a cutthroat literary agent and her beloved sister libby which is why she agrees to go to Sunshine Falls, North Carolina for the month of August when Libby begs for a sister's trip away with visions of small town transformation for Nora, who she convinced needs to be more of the heron of her own story. But instead of the picnics in meadows or run-ins with a handsome country doctor or a bulging <laughs> four-armed bartender, Nora keeps bumping into Charlie Lastra, a bookish broading editor from back in the city. A cute, if not for the fact that they've met many times and it's never been cute. <laughs> If Nora knows she's not an ideal heroine, Charlie knows he's nobody's hero. But as they are thrown together again and again, in a series of coincidences no editor worth their salt will allow, what they discover might just arrive with the carefully crafted stories they've written about themselves. I think this is a really good idea, but... So, for the sake of brevity, let's move on to the second book, book two, which is The Sentence. I've had this on my TBR for almost two to three years now. I've had this book on my TBR for a while. I can tell you that for sure. Um, so the sentence acts what we owe to the living, to the dead, to the reader, and to the book. A small independent bookstore. Obviously, I like books that take place in bookstores. A small independent bookstore in Minneapolis is haunted from November 2019 to November 2020 by the store's most annoying customer. Flora dies on All Souls Day, but she simply won't leave the store. Tuki, who has a, a who has landed a job selling books after years of incarceration, she survived by reading with murderous attention, must solve the mystery of this haunting, while at the same time trying to understand all that occurs in Minneapolis during a year of grief. Astonishment. Maybe I should be a little sore. Isolation and a furious reckoning. The sentence begins on All Souls Day, 2019 and ends of All Souls Day 2020. Its mystery and proliferating ghost stories during this one year propel a narrative as rich, emotional, and profound as anything as Louis written. Wow. This is going to be a good book. I can tell you that right now. That is it for book two. Wow. We have 24 books to go through, guys. 24 books to go through. Book three The Ethics. I'm sorry, I'm so loud. I'm like really, like, I'm really excited to read these books. So that's obviously why I picked them. So book three for The Ethics by Spinoza. Lately, I've really been into philosophy. Spinoza was one of the, the philosophers that I've really been reading into lately. And then he actually published one of the books called The Ethics. He didn't actually publish it because most of his books were published after he passed away. We're not, we're not going to get deep into this. I think I could talk all, all day about this and... We're not going to get into that. Published shortly after, after his death in 1677, The Ethics is Spinoza's greatest work, a fully cohesive philosophical system that strives to provide a picture of reality and to comprehend the meaning of an ethical life. 
It defines in turn the nature of God, the mind, human bondage, the emotions, and the power of understanding. Moving from a consideration of the eternal to speculate upon the human humanity's place in a natural order and the path to attainable happiness. A work of elegant simplicity, the ethics is a brilliantly insightful consideration of the possibility of the redemption through philosophical reflection. This book is a Christmas gift. So that is book number three by Spinoza on the ethics. Woo! Next we have Emma. So Emma, I've actually read in school this year. I don't know if you can tell. This book looks like this because it's been out in the rain. My book just got all wet and like disgusting. Yeah, I really annotated this book well. Anyway, we're not going to get into that and how the water ruined my annotations and how the book even looks. I'm disgusted, but let's ignore that. We have another version of Emma. This is like my fifth time rereading this summary over again because I keep mispronouncing um, a word. Emma, pretty bright and born atop of the social strata of the English village of Highbury. Emma Woodhouse has all anyone would want, but she is fated to become the victim of her own impressible willfulness. Because of the recent marriage of her friend and governess, Emma fills a void in her life by attempting to improve Harriet Smith, a sweet, pretty 17-year-old of the unknown parentage. Emma's good-hearted attempts to rearrange the lives of Harriet and other marriageable townspeople are then the incitement to the book's subtle, intricately constructed plot. Austin employs a sympathetic, gentle satire as she portrays the provincial, that's the word I kept saying wrong incorrectly, townspeople, all of whom are good-hearted but have their own particular streak of ridiculousness. Emma's father, Mr. Woodhouse, is deferred to all by main, but maintain, maintains an absurd aversion to change and overweening concern for maintaining what he considers to be a well-measured, healthy lifestyle. The chatty Miss Bates, <laughs> she's hilarious. <laughs> the chatty Miss Bates is sweet-tempered, but talks incessantly about everything that comes into view. And then there's Emma herself, who seems to know all but her own heart. With the tightly weaved moments of the characters and the interplay of their romantic schemes, Emma has elements of a well-done mystery novel, but... What? Continued on black back flop. Why do they make the text so big then? Okay. The rest is right here. <laughs> the book's leisurely exposition and skillful use of irony makes it an amusing com comedy of manners in which the reader can savor the all too familiar foibles. Foibles? Foible. Okay, it's foibles. Sorry, it really bothers me, but I cannot pronounce the word correctly. What Emma's about, and we're gonna be rereading it um, next year. So I'm excited to reread it. Um, this is a different edition. This is not exactly the same translated version as this one here that we read in school, but it's the same story. And it's also a contemporary version of Jane, I mean, Jane Austen's Emma is, what is that movie? I literally just slipped my mind. Okay, Clueless. Clueless is inspired by um, Jane Austen's Emma. Let's move on to book number five. And then there were none by Agatha Christie. I have not read Agatha Christie um, yet. This is my first novel that I actually own or, and I'm going to read by her. So, Ten strangers are lured into an isolated island mansion off the Devon coast by a mysterious UN Owen. At dinner, a recorded message ac accuses each of them in turn of having a guilty secret and by the end of the night, one of the guests is dead. Stranded by a violent storm and a haunted and haunted by a nursery rhyme, counting down one by one, as one by one, they begin to die. <laughs> Which among them is a killer and will any of them survive? Wow. The short summary on the back of the book like caught onto me. Like, how could you just say so much in so little words? So I'm like, okay. And I've also heard that Agatha Christie's a really good writer. So and people love her mystery books and her mysteries. Number six, we have The Vanishing Half by Britt Bennett. So why did I pick this book? And this is why. Barnes and Noble's the other day. I'm like, okay, let me just pick only books in the buy one get one 50% off. I already spent a lot of money on books this year so far. I've seen that this was a really good book and a lot of people have been recommending this on BookTok. With five months that I haven't had TikTok or any social media like that. YouTube's kind of my only social media. I'm sorry, I'm saying so much in between the lines, but let me just read you guys the, <laughs> the long summary that we have in the back. The Vino sisters will always be identical. 
But growing up together in a small Southern Black community and running away at age 16, it's not just the shape of their daily lives that is different as adults. It's everything. Their families, their communities, their racial identities. Many years later, one sister lives with her Black daughter in the same Southern town that she tried to escape. The other secretly passes for white and, their white and her white husband knows nothing of her past. Still, although separated by so many miles and just as many lies, the fates of the twin remain intertwined. What will happen to the next generation when their own daughter's story lines intersect? Weaving together multiple strands and generations, The Vanishing Half is at once a riveting family story and a brilliant exploration of the American history of passing. Looking well beyond the issues of race, it considers the lasting influence of the past as it shapes a person's decisions, desires, and expectations. I didn't remember what this book was about until I just read the summary. I got this book like, oh, like last week. So it's a really interesting book. I feel like I wouldn't have picked it up and bought it if I thought it wasn't interesting. Book number seven, we have, which I did get for Christmas, The Song of Achilles, book seven and eight together. So. I also got Earths for Christmas as well. So I have these two Greek um, mythologies. So I'm going to read Song of Achilles first because I believe this came out in 2012. And correct me if I'm wrong, this came out in like 2020 or 2018 or something like that. So I've been really into Greek mythology and philosophy, which is kind of like very different. But <laughs> I, that's the two main like readings and research that I've been doing a lot on. So Greek mythology and philosophy that I've really been looking upon on. So first to start off with the Song of Achilles. Um, this is actually the same author, Madeline Miller. Um, I'm excited to read these books. I did start Circe. I'm like, okay, let me just read this one first. Achilles, the best of all Greeks, son of the cruel sea goddess, Thetis, and a legendary, a legendary king, Peleus, is strong, swift, and beautiful, irresistible to halt all who meets him. Patroclus is an awkward young prince, exiled from his homeland after an act of violence. But brought together by chance, they forge an inseparable bond, despite risking the god's wrath. They are trained by the centaur, Chiron, right? Chiron in the arts of war and medicine. But when the word comes that Helen of Sparta has been kidnapped and the heroes of Greece are called upon to lay siege to Troy in her name, seduced by the promise of glorious destiny, Achilles joins their cause and torn between love and fear for his friend, Patroclus follows. Little do they know that the cruel fates will test them both as never before and demand a terrible sacrifice. That is for the Song of Achilles. Book eight, also by Madeline Beer beer did i just say madden beer i meant <laughs> madeline Mil miller <laughs> sorry in the house of elios a god of the sun and the mightiest of titans a daughter is born but circe is a strange child not powerful like her father nor viciously alluring like her mother turning to the world of mortals for companionship she discovers that she does possess power the power of witchcraft which can't transform ri rivals into monsters and the men of gods themselves Threatened, Zeus banishes Circe to a des deserted island where she hones her occult craft and crosses paths with many of the famous figures in all of mythology, including Minotaur, the Dallas, and his doomed son, Icarus, the murderous Medea, and of course with Odysseus. Danger too, for a woman who stands alone, and Circe unwittingly draws the wrath of both men and gods, ultimately finding herself pitted against one of the most terrifying and vengeful of Olympians. To protect what holds dear, Circe must summon her strength and choose once and for all whether she belongs with the gods she is born from with, with the gods that she is born from or the mortals that she has come to love. For book number nine, we have Catch 22, which is another one of the buy one, get one 50 books, number one, but that is not why I got it, okay? It's definitely a banned book somewhere. I can tell you that. I also got it because it was a banned book. <laughs> I do want to read more banned books. Set in Italy during World War II, by the way, I love books during World War II. Just to point that out. <laughs> Set in Italy during World War II, this is a story of the incomparable, malignoring martyr. Am I saying that right? <laughs> Eurysian, a hero who is a furious, who is furious because thousands of people he has never met are trying to kill him. But his real problem is not the enemy, it is his own army, which keeps increasing the number of missions the men must fly to complete the service. Yet if a Eurysian makes any attempt to excuse himself from the polar missions he's assigned, he will be in violation of Catch-22. 
a hilariously sinister bureaucratic rule. A man, a man is considered insane if he willingly continues to fly dangerous combat missions, but if he makes a formal request to be removed from the duty, he is proven sane and therefore in ineligible to be relieved. We're not even halfway through this video. For the next book I have is Unabridged Journals of Sil Sylvia Plath. To keep in mind, I actually did start this book. I only got it to page 189, but I'm definitely going to start over because I started this in the beginning of the year, never finished it. And then I also felt like it was pretty challenging to read a little bit. It is. So these are just random journals from Sylvia Plath, but I'm going to try again because I do really love Sylvia Plath. I'm definitely going to start this again, so I don't know why I still have it in this bookmark. I did make like a lot of annotations and stuff like that in this book, but I'm definitely going to start over. So reread. So... <laughs> Published in the entirety for the first time, Sylvia Plath's journals provide an intimate portrait of the writer who was produced in the last seven months of her life. Some of the most extraordinary poems of the 20th century. Faithfully transcribed from the 23 journals and, and journal fragments owned by Smith College, the unabridged journals of Sylvia Plath includes two journals that Plath's husband, Ted Hughes, unsealed before his death in 1998. A heavily abridged edition of Plath's Diaries was published in 1892, sorry, 18, 1982. <laughs> Roughly two-thirds of this new abridged edition is material that has never before been made public, revealing more fully the intensity of the poet's personal and literary struggles and providing fresh insight into both her frequent desperation and the bravery which she faced, which she faced her demons. With this haunting, vibrant, and brutally honest prose, the unabridged journals of Sylvia Plath is essential reading for all those who have been moved and fascinated by Platt's life, life and work. Definitely moved by Platt's life and work. I can tell you that's why I got this. For a segue into the next book I'm going to talk about by Sylvia Platt that I have not yet to read is The Bell Jar. So Sylvia Platt takes upon a gripping journey into the fragile psyche of Esther Greenwood. Set against the backdrop of 1950s America, this semi- autobiographical <laughs> novel explores the stifling expectations placed upon women and the suffocating grasp of social norms. As Esther grapples with her ambitions, desires, and her mental health, she finds herself trapped in a metaphorical bell jar, an oppressive glass enclosed that isolates her from the world. Plast's executive prose and pognant portrayal of Esther's descent descent into madness made the bell jar a timeless masterpiece that shines a searing light on the complexities of the human psyche and on unre unrelenting quest for self-identity so that is which is a it's a relatively short book actually it's like 210 to 18 pages amazing next few books that we got actually that i have are kind of like poet i have some poetry here I want to read so the book that we have is this day is dark i bought this like two weeks ago um my friend actually got this for me two weeks ago but i bought it she picked it out for me so it's called this day is dark i've actually wrote um read a book by rh sin by um it was called planting gardens and graves i think um i he's a he's a he's, he's a fine um poet i can say um but it's called this day is dark and literally all the pages are like dark but something that I noticed when I got the book that the spine was already ripped. I'm just gonna read the back too because it's not, it's not that much to say. <laughs> Pain has always been a map towards triumph. It hurts of course but you are made wiser. You are made stronger and you always find your way out. Walk through the fire and into the light. For number 13 we have As Long As It's Big by John Breakers. Years in the making As Long As It's Big is a stunning and unique poetic achievement. By turns of rollicking, funny, and deeply moving, this dramatic poem tells a tragic story. John Briku cleanly balances sensitive portrayals of painful lives with hilarity, chaos, and occasionally ribald caricatures. I never say that word right either. Caricatures. Hugely entertaining and immensely readable, Riku's first and narrative will absorb anybody seeking to unravel the truths of modern family life. So that is... Book number 13, as long as it's big. Book number 14, we have Derek Walcott's Collected Poems from 1948 to 1984. Book number 15, The Greatest Tragedies of Shakespeare. So honestly, to be honest with you guys, I've read all these books in school, definitely. Definitely did, but let me tell you what books are in here. We have Romeo Juliet, which I've read. 
Hamlet, Julius Caesar, Macbeth. The only book I did not read in this was Othello because in my AP Lit class, we never read Othello. I'm definitely gonna reread all of this. I love Shakespeare, so that's my goal for this year to reread these, well, reread these four um, Shakespeare um, plays and then read Othello. So that is the next one. I just really wanna show you the front and the, I just wanna show you the front, the binding. The pages, like I just love the pages. It's, it's amazing. This is a beautiful edition. I got this for Christmas as well. Number 16, we have a thousand boy kisses. And let me tell you, let me tell you where I got this from. So my best friend was on TikTok <laughs> and she was share playing this book. Oh, this is by Tilly Cole, by the way. She was, I got this for Christmas from her. <laughs> Let's put this back there. So a few weeks ago or a week or two ago, um, she was share playing her TikTok and then she was showing me like this book. And like people were like a lot of reviews like people were like crying over this book like how could a book be so sad <laughs> you know and i really love extremely sad books because like i just i love it like i feel it i relate to it so apparently this book is really sad and i really want i really want to get into it i think it's a ya book though which it doesn't mean anything but like come on like i don't know this doesn't look like a book that i would normally pick up but come on like Oh, let me read. Sorry, I should be reading. I didn't know what to say, but th this is what I'm supposed to say. One boy, one girl, a bond that is forged in an instant and cherished for it, that is instant and is cherished for a decade. A bond that neither time nor distance can break. A bond that will last forever, or so they believe. <laughs> when 17 year old Rune C Christian returns from his native Norway to the sleepy town of Blossom Grove, Georgia, where his befriended Poppy Lynchworth Lynchfield was a child as a child. He has just one thing on his mind. Why did the girl who was one half of his soul, who promised to wait faithfully for his return, cut him off without a word of explanation? Rune's heart was broken two years ago when Poppy fell silent. But when he discovers the truth of her absence, he finds that the greatest heartache is yet to come. So that is all in this sad book right here that is leading people to tears. I want to cry too, I'm telling you. I'm gonna do a book review on this one and tell you, I'm gonna tell you if it's like worth the hype, definitely. Or if people are just like crying. For books 17 and 18, I don't have. But let me tell you, I'm going to post the um, the titles or book covers on them. So for number 17, we have The Oedipus Cycle, Oedipus Rex, Oedipus at Colonist, and Antigone by Sophocles. So let me tell you. So I did read this semester of about the burial of Thebes. So that was by Seamus Henley. Seamus Henney? I think was his name so we read that I'm like dude I'm sorry I'm like come on like this is amazing this is amazing like I love I love this so I love the the idea of fate free will a predetermined um destiny I love I love all of that you know that's kind of why that's kind of that kind of branches me into like my ph philosophical um interests and stuff like that anyway let's not even let's not rant about this I read antigone basically because it was translated by seamus haney but i did not read the two preceding um texts which was oedipus rex and oedipus Icon. it's not like a series it's just it's not like one leads to the other it's not like it's more of like a trilogy than an actual series like you can read one standalone if that makes sense like you can read antigone by itself without reading oedipus rex if that makes sense okay so I do want to read the Oedipus Cycle, which all comes in one book on Amazon, actually. I don't want to buy the three separate books. Come on now. It's like three books in one, basically. Next we have, for number 18, we have Best of Friends, which I'll put right here, which is by Camilla Shamsi. And I'm telling you right now, Camilla Shamsi is an amazing author. I can tell you right now, because this semester, this was also inspired by what I read this semester. Um, it, the book was called Home Fire. It is also a contemporary version of Antigone. Um, written by Seamus Haney and Sophocles. So I'm just like, wow, she's an amazing author and I need to read another book by her. So we're going to be reading Best of Friends in 2024. And I'm hoping, which is, also, Best of Friends is also um, a Christmas gift that I got, which I did not receive yet, but it's going to be right. I'm going to put it right here. Camilla Shamsi, if I can recommend you any book in the world right now, it will be Home Fire by Camilla Shamsi. I can tell you right now, I've never read a book in a while that can that I can really like go back to and reread again because I, re I read that book like almost twice. I'm telling you that right now. And again, I still think about 
all these characters to this day like i i felt for these characters like these she did a she's an amazing writer i've i should have put this book first like i could have put this book first to tell you guys about but best of friends is what i'm gonna read next and i'm she's an amazing writer she's amazing she's amazing she's amazing it's an amazing book if i can recommend you home fire my face is like getting hot home fire was the best book that i read this year i can tell you that right now i'm sorry it's the best book that i read this year all right let's calm down now <laughs> number 19 which is a series i want to finish the harry potter series and let me get into it i only have books two to four but i've also read book one but I, book two was actually the first book that i've ever bought but now I'm now ever since I bought books, I never stopped buying books. Like I'm tired of like buying borrowing from the library because like I hate being rushed for books. Even though it's like less costly and it'll definitely save me more um, money considering I'm a broke college student. I just have to buy my books now and just waste my money on buying books. Okay, I only read these, but most of this one, but these. So the amount of times i restarted the harry potter series is crazy like i probably read this book book two and book one about three times already restarting the series like okay i'm gonna finish books one through eight one through seven i'm gonna get through it fast like come on this is light right <laughs> wrong this year i'm gonna be doing and my best friend's also the same way like she she started the harry potter series never finished it and we're around like the same books ish I think she's probably still in book two. I forgot. But this year we're going, well, next year we're going to be doing, well, 2024. Um, this is on December 27th, 2023 that I'm recording this. So next year, 2024, in a few days, we're going to be doing a challenge for reading the entire Harry Potter series within two weeks because we need to get this out of the way. We need to get this out of the way. We're done. We're tired of like rereading books and we're we're just going to finish the series. I'm going to buy the rest of the books. I usually buy my books secondhand, so that's why not all the books came. So then we have 20, the Before the Coffee Gets Cold series. And I don't know if these are, I think these are standalones, but they go in order-ish. So they're not completely connected, but they're kind of connected. So yeah, I started reading this book. I'm like halfway through-ish. In a small back alley of Tokyo, there is a small cafe that has been serving carefully brewed coffee for more than a hundred years. Local legend says that this shop offers something else besides coffee, the chance to travel back in time. I love time travel, you know. I'm a Flash fan and you know, I'm wearing I'm wearing my Flash, okay, I'm sorry, this is getting really distracting. I'm wearing my Flash Star Lab shirt. Definitely love time travel, love the idea of time travel. Over the course of one summer, four customers visit the cafe in the hopes of making that journey, but time travel isn't so simple. And there are rules that must be followed. Most important, the trip can only last as long as it takes for the coffee till the coffee gets cold. Heartwarming, wistful, mysterious, and delightfully quirky. This is um, a Japanese series translated in English. Number 21, Her Sweet Revenge. So my best friend actually picked out this book for me and um, I got it. Lena is a beautiful, successful, and, and living in married bliss in Exeter. But she is hiding a secret that could tear her perfect life apart. When the notes begin to arrive, she realizes someone else must know. But what might her husband and his overbearing family do if they find out the truth? Thea is reeling from her best friend's Helena's death, but when she starts digging into the circumstances, she receives a threatening note warning her to stop. She knows her best friend's death wasn't an accident. It was a murder. And she's determined to get revenge. And everyone knows it's almost always the husband. Ooh. So... That was Her Sweet Revenge by Sarah um, Bonner. Number 22, Five First Chances by Sarah Jost. And the thing about these novels that my best friend had picked for me and another one, um, she seemingly tried to pick novels that would apply uh, in poetry books that would apply to my real life situation. So let's read what this one's about. What would you do if you had one more chance to get things right? Lo feels like she is stuck on a wrong path, alone in a city far from home, watching other people be happy. <laughs> when the man thinks she's in love with, when the man she's in love with announces his engagement to someone else, Lo is consumed by the what ifs. That's when she finds herself slipping back in time to a night two years ago where one small decision changed everything. <laughs> Suddenly, Lo has a chance to fix her mistakes, but as her choices lead her down roads she never could have imagined, she finds herself stuck in a time loop of her own making. Obviously, my best friend knows that um, time travel is my forte. Like, I love reading about time travel. 
obviously, and with each slip, low life intersecting with one person again and again. A friend of a friend who <laughs> once lived on a periphery who is slowly becoming the one person who makes her feel like she might be finally living on the right track. Lo is about to realize that our greatest love stories aren't always the ones we expected, but are the ones who we choose to fight for. So that is Five First Chances by Sarah Joss. Number 23, we have The Hating Game by Sarah Ro Sorry. Is Sarah Rooney an author? I'm telling you, I thought this said Sarah Rooney. Let me, we have to look this up. Normal people, conversation with friends, beautiful, beautiful world, where are you? Mr. Salary, two stories. Her name is Sally Rooney. Okay, let's go back. Sorry. That's a whole different author that I was thinking about. So Sally Thorne with The Hating Game. Wow, the text is really tiny. Okay. Lucy Hooten and Joshua Templeman hate each other. Not dislike. Not begrudgingly tolerating. Don't even... Begrudg begrudgingly hate and they have no t no problems displaying their feelings through a series of ritualistic passive aggressive members as they sit across from each other ex executive assistants the ceos of a pub publishing company lucy cannot understand joshua's joyless uptight meticulous approach to his job joshua is as, joshua is clearly baffled by lucy's over overly bright clothes quirk quirkiness and pollyanna attitude i've never heard of the word pollyanna too. Now that they're up for the same promotion, their battle of wills have come to a head and Lucy refuses to go back down when their latest game could not cost her dream job. But the tension between Lucy and Joshua has also reached its boiling point and Lucy is discovering that maybe she doesn't hate Joshua. It's definitely a love story. Um, it's enemies to lovers. That's literally what this is. And maybe he doesn't hate her either. Or maybe this is just another game. So this is just the hating game by sally thorne not sally rooney or sarah rooney whoever that is last book that we have for 2024 that we are announcing on december 27 2023 is the edgar Allan poe ultimate collection of short stories and his poetry so i should just tell you why <laughs> i got this um this was um a christmas gift that i asked for <laughs> a christmas book that i asked for um i just wanted to first start off by saying that i love edgar Allan poe he's definitely my favorite poet i of all time edgar Allan poe never fails to me um like i said before i love sad books Lo love sad genres love sad stuff so edgar Allan poe is the sadness or the the symbol of sadness for poetry that's why i love him so i would say most of my writing most of my poetry most of my creative writing is based off of edgar allen's poe's poetry and like the way he writes i love his writing style i just wanted to have it all in one book like i had to have it all in one collection i wanted to analyze it more i wanted to do all that so that's kind of why i wanted the edgar allen poe collection and also pretty big text actually so i can and i have so much space to annotate we have a lot of stuff to dissect in this book so that was our last book for 2024 so let's give us a round of applause and let's see how much we would actually read in 2024 because number one i'm a pretty slow reader number two i have a lot of books um for fall 2024 and spring 2024 of next year so i hope i reach this goal i'm not sure i'm not completely confident but we're gonna try our best but yeah thank you guys for watching so much i'll see you guys in the next video